Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, product leadership, coding, data analytics, UX design, and digital marketing courses online and at our 16 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Today, we have an awesome guest presenting. I'd like to introduce you to Bill Erdman. Bill is a high-tech product management veteran, having worked in the profession for the past 30 years. Bill's specialty is in product areas that are disruptive, where new product entrants challenge the norms of an existing product market. He has experienced many of the business and product risks associated with bringing disruptive products to market, where companies underinvest as the outcomes are unknown and then acquire to catch up. Bill has onboarded several of these acquisitions into much larger companies as former director of product management for both Cisco and VMware. Feel free to leave any questions for Bill in the comments of Facebook, and I'll be sure to ask him them at the end. Without further ado, let's welcome Bill. Thanks for joining us today. Great, thank you, Dan. Good morning to everyone and good afternoon. Um, before I get started, Dan, where do I get my presentation up and going? Uh, the same button is not there anymore. Mm, oh, let's see. Mm, it might be at the top of your screen. Okay. Gallery view, let's see. Start video, stop video, start video. Hmm. Um, there's no screen share there now. Mm -mm. Let me see if this helps. <clears throat> Sorry for the interruption to all those are on the, 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 uh, the session. We'll get going in a second. Um, are you seeing the screen? No, I still don't see it. Uh, you could share it with me if you'd like. Um, or let's see. Sometimes Zoom just, it disappears, the button to click screen share. Are you in, do you have the presentation pulled up in full screen in the background? Uh, I, I, I do now, yes. And uh, there's no button for it. Let's see. Share, Let's try this. Oh, there we go. All right. Nice. Great, okay, and it's in full screen. Well, great, thank you for the great introduction, Dan. As Dan mentioned, yes, I am a, a product management veteran. I have worked for multiple different high-tech companies in my career out here in Silicon Valley, primarily in the networking space. So you're gonna hear about my experience being very network-centric, but you know, and those that aren't, who don't, aren't familiar with networking, it is an infrastructure technology tied to computing and storage and series of other things. It's basically the backbone that connects the world together these days from an information technology perspective. I've worked in uh, the market since its inception early on in the 80s, where it was a $200 million business. It's now you know, a multi-billion dollar. I work in the data center space, which is actually a $10 billion um, market in, in business opportunity. And of course, you know, there has been a lot of um, interesting advances in that technology. Now, as Dan has mentioned, um, I have worked on multiple different product areas. Some of those where the outcome has been based upon the company uh, not investing, under investing, and needing to make an acquisition. And those can be very disruptive. So it is really my pleasure today to basically talk to you about, you know, the difference between what I would call product management and that's certainly how I worked in my early days as a product manager in product leadership. And um, I think that's one of the, the primary differences when you start to think about whether you should build or buy from a technology perspective. Product leaders have a much more open view on technology. They're not as wedded to their own product. They're more wedded to the success of the market, the company, and the customer versus just the success of their product alone. And in all too often, I think product managers get caught in their own vortex of the company and the product they're representing versus that in terms of what the market and the customers really need and having a broader perspective. So I'm gonna go through all of that. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it means once you acquire and bring in a company because it's not all rosy and pretty. There's a lot of organization 
work that needs to be done. There's a lot of work to get the go-to-market, to get the product out to the customer itself. And then there's issues with regards to um, it being disruptive, um, even with customers who may have been buying your product to begin with, and now you're going to be switching them out and having them buy something else. And when you are in the technology space, customers make a three to five year technology investment typically in your product. If you're switching them out after they're, they're a year or two down the road, it is very disruptive and can be very disconcer disconcerting to them. Okay, so as this slide says, you know, M&As, while they look sexy and pretty, and I know in a lot of B schools you study, you know, how a uh, merger and acquisition can really leverage the company and add a lot to the books, whether it's from a finance perspective or from a technology perspective, most acquisitions fail. I think 90 to 90% of acquisitions do fail and it's either because the decision was made incorrectly up front and or there was poor execution in terms of onboarding the technology and building in, in it into the product revenue and product streams. So having said that, um, I think a good place to start, um, especially for those that are fairly new in their careers and aren't necessarily familiar with how senior management thinks and behaves. And as I've grown in my career, I've certainly had a lot more exposure to senior management. I typically work now at a VP level. Um, and I can tell you quite honestly that uh, most senior management resist acquisitions. And um, if you as a product manager come up with the conclusion that you think you should be making an acquisition to, to cover the market and or um, better compete, don't be surprised if you get a negative reaction. And it's primarily because the senior management um, believes that they've already have their bets covered. You know, they, a lot of big organizations work top down. They have a big investment portfolio. They, they've made their decisions for the years in terms of how they're gonna fund the business units and the products behind them. The, the management teams have uh, led them to believe that their bets are covered, that they've got the right level of investment. You know, they've already made 10, 15, 20, $30 million worth of investment in a given product area. And so why should they go out and basically have to acquire and bring in a new technology and, you know, and add more to the, the, their cost, if you will. Um, and a lot of senior managers will view acquisitions as a weakness in how they've been managing. So they're fundamentally against it. If they have to go acquire, it means that they haven't been executing correctly internally. So these things you should definitely keep in mind in terms of, you know, if you were in, if and when you're in a position to make a recommendation, the best way to address your market space is through a merger or an acquisition. Um, don't be surprised if you get a lot of pushback. And I will discuss how you can address that pushback with a well-documented business case um, when and if you get to that point. Okay, so having said that, let me give you a couple of the, the pitfalls I have seen um, as a product manager. And then I'm gonna basically discuss with you what you can do um, to overcome those pitfalls. And it's really sort of a mental framework in your head, if you will, versus anything else to become more of a product leader. So all too often what I've seen is that product managers get lost in their own organization and look at, you know, if they only had these three more features, they would win and beat their competition and they would do marvelously well. And so they are really, working hard, as they should be, uh, pushing on the organization to build in the next set of capabilities so they can better compete. So they're working with their, their manager to sponsor perhaps a little bit more investment. They're working, if you're in high tech, you often will work, you work directly with engineers on getting the development done that you need. And in high tech, it typically takes six to 12 months to get any feature out of significance and you're really um, working hard in outlining that feature, talking directly with the engineers, articulating that feature out to the salespeople itself, talking directly to customers, and just basically pushing really hard on your organization to get something done. So you get a little bit myopic, if you will, um, and rightfully so, because it's your job um, as a PM to really push and enable the organization to get the things done that you need to make the product successful in, in the marketplace. It could be a go-to-market, you know, it could be a sales issue, it could be a channel issue. Typically, for most product managers, 
it is a feature or a product a development issue. So they spend a lot of their time pushing really hard on the organization and being very focused. Often they're unaware of the resources really required to achieve success. Um, they may be, and I've been in this situation many times, especially when it's a new product to market um, that you know, the, the organization believes and the engineering has told the senior management that you, you, know, you can do it with 20 engineers and that when you look out into the market, actually look at the competition and maybe it's a focused startup, they may have 50 or 60 engineers. So while your engineers may be great and most engineers think they are great, it's hard to basically make up ground when you have 20 engineers and your competition has 60. And, and that's a perfect segue into the next slide. And so from a product leadership perspective, you take a broader view and you have a broader understanding of the market. So instead of being focused on just what your organization can develop and deliver and what you can push on to get that organization to come up with something so you can be successful, you actually build out your understanding of the market. So you understand competitively what's going on. You have to have an ear to your competition. The more networking that you can have out into the market, whether it's peers that are working for a startup and or you, you establish relationships with analysts that are basically looking across the market um, and they basically are writing reports about what's going on in this space and or and actually where the best information often comes is from customers. So being out and talking to your customers and hearing what they're seeing from the marketplace and from the competition gets you a stronger, broader view of the market. And that's where the leadership really starts coming in. And so you become the expert, not just on what the current product is that you represent and the features that you're driving, but you understand what the competition is doing, how many people that you know the, the, the competition has in building out that product. Um, and the product leaders um, are recognized as the experts um, and, and product managers are recognized as experts as well. But the difference is, is that a product leader is recognized as a market expert, as a competitive expert, as, as almost an analytic expert, not just that you are, you are the one that knows your product best within the company itself. And that's really the difference here. And so then the product leaders, when you have a broader set of information that you're working with, you will know um, fundamentally whether your product that you're representing is gonna make it or not. And then that is where the true leadership comes in. And it will be something that you have in your head, you'll know innately whether it's gonna make it or not. You'll know quantitatively based upon the resources, the investment, the features, your pricing, and even your go-to-market. Those are all quantifiable. But you're gonna also know um, just um, innately um, based upon what you see in the marketplace itself, whether you're gonna make it. And then at that point, if you fundamentally believe that you are, you're not gonna make it, this is when you begin to start thinking about and especially it's really coming from a mid or big product company perspective, when you start to think about um, you know, making an acquisition that's gonna really address the space. Um, and that you know, I think is the, you're sort of the tipping point, but you don't get there by being just focused on your own product. And you don't get there by just being focused on you know, a set of features that uh, you think the engineering can build in. You get there from an acquisition perspective by having a broad understanding of the market, a broad understanding of the competition, and a broad understanding of what the customers really need, and know fundamentally that you're gonna have a product miss. Okay, so um, once you get to that point where you know fundamentally you're gonna have a product miss, you begin documenting the business case. And the business case at that point will come easily, believe it or not. You think, oh, geez, you know, business cases, they're 10 pages, they're 20 pages, they're 30 pages. And I, I've seen the gamut. I've seen acquisitions made based upon, you know, a two-page PowerPoint presentation. And typically, the best way that things are socialized in today's environment is actually through a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and you begin to document 
you know, all the things that I just mentioned from a competitive perspective, from a, from a feature perspective, from a customer requirement perspective, you begin to really start pointing to the gaps. You're realistic and you have the ear of your, your executive management um, that your product development team is not gonna, gonna make it. Now, this is where, you know, you've got a little bit of, uh, how do I say it? A little bit of an issue where you may disenfranchise your best partner, which is the team making your product. And if you go to management and say to them that the, your team that is really the ones that are developing the product aren't gonna make it, you've got a little disenfranchise going. But remember that if the product misses, you all lose. So at some point you've got to disenfranchise them if you fundamentally believe that you've got to get out of this you know, the way to get out of Dodge, if you will, is through this acquisition. So um, what are some of the business imperatives? You, well, in the technology world, um, there are a lot of strategic and solution reasons why you'd make an acquisition. Um, and technologies can get very complicated, especially if you're in the infrastructure space as I am. And I'm actually gonna walk you through a good technology example of what I went through when I was over at Cisco, where Cisco knew they wanted to get into uh, delivering voice packets across um, ethernet technologies. They thought it was just a transport technology play, but voice needs a set of applications to really fundamentally deliver a complete solution. Customers don't buy networking for voice, they buy voice for business productivity. And it's not just the way you transport the, the packets, if you will, or the voice information, it's all the productivity that goes with it, that being voicemail and a series of other things. So the point being here is, is that um, you might see a gap in what you're doing um, because it's not a holistic, complete solution. And the customer basically might wanna buy your piece of technology, but if it's missing something else that needs to go with it to complete the, the product itself, that's where an acquisition may come in. So it may be something complementary that you need to actually drive the success of your own product. Or again, it could be a product that is better than what you're working on. And it's just that you're not gonna get there from the way the company has been you know, building it out and so on. There are other financial reasons of why companies make acquisitions. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, that sort of is outside the realm of product management in my view. Now acquisitions do come in and people do have to manage those because typically in the high tech, it is some sort of product or service offering. When to the company, it does require product management to help go drive it, but it's not really the core of what I see as a product owner when you see that there's a significant gap in the product space you're working on. It's either typically because you're, you don't have the right feature sets and you can't compete, or you're not gonna be able to sell your product because it's missing other components that have to complete the solution for the customer to have a success on it itself. Okay, now there are a couple things that go with um, the product in the acquisition itself. Um, the acquisition can help drive the core vision, core business. Um, and I've seen a lot of business cases made where the company needs to acquire to actually deliver on the core business goals. And, uh, and again, I'll go back to, I'll touch upon this example as I talk through the Cisco experience I had. And also, as I just mentioned, the product is a direct fit from a broader solution perspective. You actually can drive a broader, broader product portfolio, uh, increase the, the revenues of the company itself. You know, in, in actually something I learned early on in my career is, is that in a fast growing market um, where there's a lot of, not, lot of product entries um, and the company really wants to get ahead of it, they'll make multiple different acquisitions um, to basically, um, you know, capitalize on the market itself. Um, so there are a couple things that you need to understand when you start to think about an acquisition. Um, basically, one of the things is, is making sure that that acquisition aligns with the customer's um, sort of acquisition models. Um, and in the enterprise sort of infrastructure market, customers have well-known acquisition models. So an acquisition of a product needs to make sure that it is 
uh, fits into their stack from a technology perspective. But in, in some cases, customers like new technologies, um, but because again, as I mentioned, it's typically a three to five and often a seven year investment, um, they don't necessarily trust a startup if they were to basically go buy somebody's product and that company were to go belly up after a year and they invested it in heavily and they're running their business on it, they don't wanna be left out in the lurch. So sometimes an acquisition makes sense uh, because it fits into your stack. And if you're in a bigger company and you're giving the, the well-backed sort of guarantee that you're gonna be around, no one gets fired for bu buying IBM, no one gets fired for buying Cisco. Sometimes the startup products fit better into a larger company because the larger company can financially back them and give them you know, the, the sort of the guarantee that the customer is looking for. Okay, so let me give you an, a good at, example of what I went through. And this was back in the early 2000s. I was over at Cisco and we were in a rapidly expanding market where we were selling switched ethernet and basically uh, selling ethernet back in the old <laughs> days when people actually had desktop computers on their, 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 uh, in their cubicles. We were selling a lot of data ports, but we knew that that market was going to get mature and that basically the 30 or 40% sales growth we are seeing year over year was going to slow down because there are only so many desktops that people were gonna connect. Um, and so what we realized is, is that if you could also um, ship, uh, you could also ship voice over the data ports um, and those connections could be not just for desktop computers, but you could also plug your phones in. We were going to sell a lot more switch Ethernet ports. So we basically worked on figuring out how to ship voice packets over uh, data transport technology, that being Ethernet. And we did a really good job at the transport layer and being able to deliver voice in a real time way and in in, in, with non disruptive, it made it, you know, made, made voice very clear and, and whatnot. But what we, and I was a product manager behind a lot of that infrastructure transport and actually a product manager where we actually came out with um, an ethernet phone, if you will, which is pretty much the norm in today's market itself. The problem we were having though, is that people didn't want to just buy a phone and they just didn't want to buy another connection to the, um, uh, on the data center switch or the, 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 the campus switch. What they wanted was a complete experience of when they picked up the phone you know, they were able to get voicemail. They were able to transfer a call. They were able to do a bunch of other things. They're able to get what we call a integrated voice response system where they could basically, you know, provide a menu of options and a series of other things. And there are a bunch of other pieces that, you know, were already in the marketplace for people using phones that were being delivered on an alternative transport technology. So we thought we, we had enough engineers to go develop those apps the company was pushing really hard on getting the revenue going as fast as they could. And um, we had a 70 person team developing these voicemail apps and a series of other things. And when you looked out across the market, which you quickly realized that it really required a 500 person team and sales couldn't hit their numbers because they couldn't sell a complete voice infrastructure. And that goes to the full stack that I mentioned earlier. So what, was driven actually through sales was the need to make acquisitions of technologies that delivered the applications that ran on top of the voice transport. And so I was there as the product manager trying to drive those, those applications if you will, with a 75 person team, we were underinvested. I was completely focused and working with that engineering team and we thought we could deliver on it, but the field said, no, we can't. So we ended up buying three companies and those three companies came in and they took over my space. And so because I was so focused on my own uh, success of the product and the team I was working with, um, basically I lost the leadership role in driving those applications and the, the companies we purchased came over and took over the leadership roles in those spaces. And I actually had to go off and do something else. So my point here is, is that there is, especially in high tech, you know, solution reasons of why you wanna make an acquisition. We were trying to drive a core capability here. We needed these applications to go drive the core market. We were underinvested. I was too focused internally to realize that we weren't gonna make it. 
we had to make an acquisition. It was driven by the sales team saying the only way it can hit the numbers is by doing this. And it was organizationally disruptive in terms of what I was doing, even though I was the owner and I actually knew the space really well. So having said that, um, once, and I hopefully touched on, you know, some of the reasons and the differences between a, a product manager and a leader here, when you get to the point of making an acquisition, once you make that acquisition, it is really important, and I can't emphasize this enough, if you are behind the acquisition, and hopefully as the product leader, um, and you make a recommendation to make an acquisition, um, and they basically make you an owner of it, it is then really, really important for you to ensure that there's a successful integration and a successful execution of that acquisition. And as I mentioned earlier on, you know, there will be a lot of resistance to an acquisition coming in. And believe it or not, especially with the engineering team that wasn't able to deliver on it, there's gonna be a lot of pushback. And there'll be people within the company that wanna see that acquisition fail. So you as a product leader have to work um, um, really, really hard, I think is the best way to, to put it, in making sure that acquisition is successful, especially if the company has spent a lot of money for it. Um, and acquisitions can be 300 million, 500 million, a billion, multi-billion, the bigger they are, you know, the bigger the stakes, the, the harder they fall, if you will, and you know, HP, Cisco, Lots of different companies have failed miserably at it. Some of them have hurt their stock price. And a lot of it has to go with the, be with good leadership bringing the product in. So the first thing I would tell you is, is that you need to what we call de-risk the roadmap. And what that means is, is that you've got to rationalize the new product coming in with the product going out. And often if it is a product that is meant to basically take over for the product that you've been working on, because you haven't been able to compete, you're gonna to have to come up with um, a roadmap that basically says obsolete this or obsolete that, um, and not basically continue down two tracks of the same technology because that's not worth the investment. And it's really hard and it takes, you know, school of hard knocks to figure out which product you're gonna basically obsolete and which one you're gonna go forward with. But it's really, really important that you rationalize that because if you don't, uh, customers are going to be confused, engineering is going to be confused, sales is going to be confused, and it will lead to um, uh, bad results. The other thing is, is that if you're going to bring this acquisition in and that product has been out shipping in the marketplace, um, it's really important to get that product onto the company price list as fast as you can to basically get the product rationalized in the look confused whether it's the company logo, some company documentation, uh, obviously you would put a uh, product pricing and ordering behind it um, and to get it out to the field as fast as you can with a good uh, product data sheet and basically a PowerPoint presentation so they understand what it is. Um, and the sooner and faster that you can get it to market, basically price listed and understood by the, the field, the better the execution and the better the success and track rate. So um, what I have seen, and I've been behind several very successful acquisitions, is the better you can execute on the product coming in through the company and getting out to the market, the faster you can do it, obviously following a lot of the product management practices of the company from a pricing and, and, and part number perspective, the more successful you're gonna be, okay? So it really comes down to after the acquisition, at least initially, having a really good go-to-market plan. And my best advice to you, if you're in that mode, is to have that go-to-market plan baked before the acquisition is completed. And what I've seen, VMware has been very successful with this, Cisco got better at it as time went on, is, is that once the acquisition has been agreed upon at the executive level, typically there's a two to three month cooling out period, the SEC has to approve it, a series of other things. It doesn't mean you just sit and wait for, for the acquisition to happen. You are working with that team coming in, coming, you know, working with them and coming up with the go-to-market. You're taking their product uh, part numbers, you're mapping them over into the company product part numbers, you're building out the price list, you're building out the product collateral. So the day the acquisition closes, you're ready to ship the product. That is really good execution from a go-to-market perspective. 
Um, and the other thing is, is that you want to ensure, and this, you know, we have said in our industry over and over again that salespeople are coin operated. And if you understand what that means is they are pay to play. They will sell what they get paid on. It's really, really important to make sure that the product that is coming in through the company now from an acquisition is compensated either the same and a lot of times even more to make it successful. So sometimes with a new acquisition, if it's viewed as really strategic or really needed to basically overcome a competitive issue or to go drive the core product, and it's a clear strategic driver, executive management and you as a product manager will recommend that they actually get double the compensation on it. So um, that will incent your salespeople to go sell it if they know they're gonna get paid twice as much commission on it versus something that they've already been selling. So there are things you can do to basically go drive, you know, a very successful go to market. Okay, and so as I mentioned, as the product comes in, you have to rationalize it from a roadmap perspective. You have to begin to understand if they're overlapping roles. If it is something that's overlapping with what you've been doing, you need to understand that. And you know, from a personal experience perspective where I had a 75 person engineering team, we replaced it with three different acquisitions. We ended up with overlapping roles. A lot of those engineers, me and product manager himself, we had to go look for new jobs. So there are, you know, disruptive things that happen organizationally, and you just should you should just be aware of that. Um, again, these things, you know, they're not all rosy, if you will. So um, my half hour is up. Um, my final takeaway here is, um, as a product leader, the best advice I can give you is to remain objective. Keep your eye open on the marketplace. Don't get sucked into the vortex of your internal organization and think all the time that, you know, um, that if you get these next two features out, everything is gonna be rosy. You need to understand what your competition, what your customers really need and what the marketplace is really requesting and be realistic with yourself and then realistic with your management team. You as a product manager should be the expert. You should understand the competition better than you know, your senior managers. Now they may understand it because they've got a broader view, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't either. You should have a broad product and marketing view. And then when you do make an acquisition, document the business case. And there are plenty of, of examples out there of how you can document a business case from an acquisition perspective. And then, you know, really important that once the deal closes during that sort of quiet period, go work like hell to Make sure you've got the go-to-market, you've got the sales, you've got the SKUs, you've got all the right presentations in the data sheet. So when the deal closes, you're ready to go sell, 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 sell. And then the other thing is be ready for organization chaos and fallout because acquisitions are disruptive, especially if they do overlap in terms of what your company has been doing um, itself. Okay. And I will end there and thank you for your time. Hopefully this has been informative and I'll turn it back to Dan. Okay, Bill. Thank you so much. That was awesome. That was jam-packed with insights. So, um, well, that's it. Let's see if we have any questions here. In our... Everyone said, thank you so much for these more advanced topics. Cool. Okay. Well, Bill, thank you for joining us. Before we leave, um, I just wanted to give all of our audience some more info on our upcoming courses and events so they have the resources to become a product manager. Our product management, product leadership, coding, data analytics, UX design, and digital marketing courses are taught online and at 16 campuses around the world by uh, top-notch product managers working at companies like Google and Facebook. In addition to that, Product School also offers weekly events every Wednesday and Thursday at our 16 physical locations. So uh, if you're located near a campus, make sure you stop by one of our weekly events. You can also find us on social media at Product School and be sure to keep up with the latest product management content at the product blog at productschool.com. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day and I hope to see you next week. Bill, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Bye now.